Now, the second, part two here, is the process itself. What steps are necessary in order to, uh, how can I say, correctly renew our minds? Because there's so many different voices out there in this world, so many different ways and teachings, and, uh, and it's easy to lose track. It's easy to lose sight of what truly God's Word is telling us, truly what God's Word is telling us. Uh, it's important that we base this, the building of our mind, the renewing of our mind, on Scripture, sola scriptura, amen? Scripture alone. It's not... Uh, in necessarily in books by, uh, although they might be great uh, preachers and authors and that, it's God's Word. That's the foundation, okay, is God's Word. And so we need to see what God's Word said. I love what uh, the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 5. For though we walk in the flesh, and the idea of walking in the flesh is we're living in this flesh, amen? We live in this world system. We live in this body that we live in, you know. And so he says, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. So our battle in this world is not against each other. It's not necessarily against other people, like false teachers and that. We expose their false teaching, but even that's not the battle. Okay, the battle is a spiritual battle. We're in a battle against the uh, principalities, the powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world. Which anybody know who that is? Satan, right? He's the leader of that. Okay, and then you have all these demonic forces. Okay, and so that's the main battle. So I love how he says this. For though we walk in the flesh, that means we're still alive in this world. We're still in this body. We do not war according to the, the weapons of this world. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, which means they're not of this world, but mighty in God. And that's a, that's a key point, okay? Whatever weapons we have that are spiritual weapons, guess what? They're in God. Our faith is in God. Our confidence is in God. The reality of the matter is that we're trusting in God to empower us and to help us to be able to come through these things victorious. Amen? And that's the goal. We want to be victorious in every aspect of the battle that we're in. Okay? Uh, mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Pulling down simply means this. To cast down, pull down by force, to destroy, to tear down, destruction, bring to ruin, demolish, uh, extracting and removing. We want to demolish the work of Satan. We want to destroy the work he's doing in this world. I don't know about you, but I, I get so tired of seeing my loved ones, people that I love and I care, and how they're so ensnared and entrapped by the evil one. And he's got them literally like he's leading them around with a ring in their nose and he's leading them around with his little finger. You get tired of that. You want to see that d destroyed. You want to see that demolished, man. Okay? And again, this is done by our relationship with the, God, with the Lord and, and, and how we're trusting in God to pull down those strongholds. And the idea of a stronghold is a fortress, a refuge, a bastion, a citadel, a sanctuary, a fort, a castle. Uh, uh, it's like a clamp or a vice grip in somebody's life, amen? And I, I don't know about you, but if you, if you talk to people that are going through a lot of different things in life and that, a lot of struggles, uh, they may be flat on their face failing. They'll tell you, it feels like I'm, I'm trapped. I'm ensnared, like I'm, I'm in some kind of vice grip. Somebody's got a grip on me, a hold on me, and I, I'm fighting to be free, but I can't get that freedom. I can't feel that freedom in that. And I love because the Word of God is the solution. He says, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And I want you to see, the knowledge of God is vitally important. Vitally important. Where do you find information about the knowledge of God? In the Bible, right? In God's Word. God reveals to us the reality of his, what His Word says, what He says, His, his mind, His thoughts, His desires, what He says is truth. Amen? He says, uh, so I, I love this. It says, uh, it, we cast down arguments, speculations, false reasonings, okay, uh, of every high thing. That's, that's something that actually thinks it's greater than God, exalts itself against God. Give me an example, okay, the whole doctrine of evolution. 
You try to talk to individuals about how wrong evolution is and that the Bible has the truth, the Bible has the, the absolute answer to where we came from, okay? God created us on the sixth day. He created man in his own image. Oh, no, no. They will fight you tooth and nail. Tooth and nail because in their mind it's evolution. And, and I'll be honest with you, anybody that really has common sense and good reasoning realizes just how idiotic that teaching really is, Amen. that belief really is, okay? Because, first of all, that means somehow or another the slime that we see on the side of the street eventually over billions of years turned into a human being. Come on, man. It's just, re uh, it's just unrealistic. It's like taking the, the stained glass windows we hear and just say they just appeared out of nowhere. But we, we look at that and we know somebody did that. Somebody did that. Just like when we look at each other, we know that, you know what, we didn't just appear out of the slime in, in, in a pond, okay, and somehow transformed to a tadpole, transformed into a fish, was transformed into some kind of uh, lizard walking on the ground, which transferred into an ape, which transferred into us. That type of thing. And yeah, I'm, I'm skipping billions of years now, okay? Yeah. So you know, okay? But the reality is, is this. The Bible tells us where we came from. But you have these people that are so, they're so ensnared into this whole idea that what they believe is right, okay? And that nothing else is correct. So every high thing that exalts itself or lifts itself up against the knowledge of God. I mean, this is the world we're living in, man. This is the world we're living in. And he, I love what he says here. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. In other words, the idea is, is subjugating every one of our thoughts, uh, getting a grip on our thinking and our, the way we think and the way we reason, getting a grip on that and realizing that, you know what? We have to bring all this to the obedience of Jesus Christ, which, who is Jesus? The Word of God. He is, he is the living Word of God. Okay, so we have to bring everything to the obedience of God's word, but we have a problem. We have a sin nature, and this sin nature, even though we're born again by the Spirit of God and He lives in us, there is still that sin nature that's at work in all of us. Okay, so we have a problem that's constantly trying to distract us, if you will, trying to get us involved in all kinds of peripheral, nonsensical things that don't matter in the scope of eternity. I mean, when we stand before the beam of seat of Jesus Christ, we're not going to be receiving rewards because of some of this silly stuff that we're, ca we're captivated in this world by. Amen? I mean, I can go into a lot of detail on these things, but right now time will not permit me to do that. But I just want you to know, we have to make sure that what we're looking for is that, you know what, my goal is Jesus and Jesus alone. I want to serve him. I want to lift his name up. I want to be an instrument in his hands. Amen? Because it's, it doesn't matter how uh, people might like me. That's not what it's about. Look at the Apostle Paul. Oh, my goodness. I look at this man's life. I says, you talk about going through the ringer. But, you know, his concern wasn't ab about how much somebody liked him or didn't like him. Even within the church, he had so many people that were constantly against him. Amen? Look at the, when you read Galatians in chapter 1. Oh, my goodness, the, the Judaizers, how they hounded him. Now, these were individuals that said they were Christian, but they wanted to add to that Christianity uh, uh, an aspect of the law, that you still had to be circumcised, that you still had to keep the ceremonial holidays, that you still had to do all these different things that were under the law. And Paul had to constantly fight them with this, amen? So there's three points, main points that I want to deal with here, okay? This, this renewing of our mind is brought about or accomplished by, number one, reading and studying God's word, amen? Reading and studying, okay? We're going to see just exactly what that entails, okay? Uh, number two is meditating on God's word. And number three, the memorization of God's word. Very important step-by-step -step procedure in order for us to be able to have the Word of God hidden in our hearts. So that when we come across anyone, or, I mean seriously, once, once the Word of God is hidden in your heart like that, you can be in a group of people and you hear someone say something, and it, all of a sudden it says, wait now, that doesn't sound right. That doesn't, I mean, yeah, he quoted a verse there, 
But it doesn't sound like that that's how that verse is meant to be used. It doesn't sound like that that's how that, that what God meant when he uh, uh, inspired, inspired the prophet or the apostle or the minister uh, with that verse. That's not what he meant, okay? Because you know why? We live in a, in a world, in a culture, where you have individuals that, that say they're Christian, and they may very well be, but they have gone off track in their understanding and their teaching. And so they take one verse and lift it completely, totally at a context that the scripture has it in. That's why it's important to be able to understand the whole counsel of God's word. Amen. And this is brought about, like I said, reading and studying God's word, meditating on God's word and memorizing the Word of God. So now, to read and study God's Word. Read means to pursue, scan, skim, browse, examine, inspect, comprehend, learn. Uh, this can lead to studying, okay? So when you read God's Word, it's not, reading is not necessarily in depth. It's not one of these things where you're digging, you take a one word and you dissect it and tear it apart. You're looking at the Greek, you're looking at the Hebrew, you're looking at the synonyms, you're looking at the dictionaries, you're looking at all these different tools that uh, are necessary in order to understand what you're reading and what you're studying, okay? I, I love this, Acts chapter 15, 30, 31 says this. So when they were sent off, they came to Antioch. Now we're talking about uh, Paul, I, I believe Paul and Barnabas, I believe it was. And when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the letter. When they had read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. Again, so another thing we see, reading God's word encourages us. Even though it's not an in-depth study, it encourages us because it helps us to realize that, you know what? Uh, this is what God's word says. And, you know, and I'm believing this. I'm trusting in this. I'm trusting in the God that wrote this. Amen. That, that inspired the writing of this. Of this. Amen. So, so, so I love that. that. It, it says, says, you know, uh, they, they brought this letter to them, and, and as they, when they read it, they rejoiced. rejoiced. And, and that's, that's how God's, God's word should. should. Sort of like in our inside of us, causes us to bubble up inside with, with excitement and rejoicing that, that, you know what, God is so good that he gave us his holy word. Amen. Amen. And, and, and I can read, read his word, and his word will uh, comfort me, will encourage me, will give me a sense of, uh, of, of knowing God's presence in my life. Amen. I love that, okay? Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2 to 4 says this. If indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he... God, that's Christ, okay, had made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which you read, you, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Now, I don't have time to go into all the whole study of the mystery, the different mysteries of the New Testament and that. I believe we did a study on Monday night study. There's like 11 different mysteries that are revealed in the New Testament and that. But I just want you to realize that, you know what, this is something that was hidden from the Old Testament saints, they did not understand the mystery of Christ Jesus, the mystery that God had in his son, Jesus Christ. They didn't even understand the reality of him being the son of God, that he was actually the second person of the triunity of God, amen, of the Godhead. They didn't even understand that. And so, uh, so Paul says, you know what, when you read this, you may understand the knowledge and the mystery of Christ, amen. I mean, that's how we, by reading, casually reading and that, we, we, and, and it would motivate us. Like I said, it'll motivate us to want to study it even more. Because once you come across that word mystery, I know the first time I came across that word mystery, I said mystery. Now, I, got, I must admit, at that time, the word mystery meant to me something that, you know, I had to figure out. But no, it's just something that was hidden in previous generations. Amen? And now it's revealed to us in these last days. Now, again, there's, there's individuals that have built whole churches around the word mystery. I don't think it's necessarily meant for that, okay? But, but it just lets us know that, you know what, as Christians, we need to understand what God's word is saying to us, amen? Colossians 4, 16 says, Now, when this epistle is read among you, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. See, again, I love this because you know what? It lets me know that the word of God is for all the churches. 
It's for everyone, every Christian, every church. It was supposed to be like the Laodicean church and you had the Colossian church. They were supposed to exchange these letters and that. Because why? This is God's word. It's God's word. 1 Thessalonians uh, 5.27. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. You know, that's what God calls us. Holy brethren. Oh, my goodness. Think about that. I mean... Uh, Take a moment and examine yourself and realize, holy brethren? Oh, Lord, help me. You know? Uh, but he says, I charge you. I give you this responsibility by the Lord. Uh, and this is not something I'm telling you to do. This is something that the Lord is directing me to tell you. Okay? I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. We need to read all of the word of God. Not just New Testament stuff, but Old Testament stuff too. Amen? New Testament and Old Testament together, and we need to study it together. Praise God. Uh, again, Timothy, 1 Timothy 4.13. Till I come, give attention to reading, exhortation, and to doctrine. Amen? Now, reading is just like I said. It's simply just reading the Word of God. Uh, I, I love that. Give attention. Devote yourself to this. It's not just, you know, pay attention. No, it's it's devoting yourself to this, making this a primary concern in your life, making this a, 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 that I'm going to do this irregardless. I'm going to say no to this so I can do this. Do you see what I'm saying? I, I mean, it's important that we understand because that, that right there will let us know how vitally important it is for us as Christians to be in the Word of God, to be in the Word of God. And exhortation, uh, now this one, exhortation and doctrine, is almost like a it works hand in glove here. Uh, exhortation is consultation, appeal, uh, to implore, encouragement, and comfort. Okay, so an exhortation is when somebody is speaking the word of God and reading the word of God in such a way as to where you feel within yourself, wow, man, God is so good. He loves me so much. I just, I can't comprehend that kind of love. I, I just don't, I don't know why he even loves me that much. You know what I mean? And, that. and then you have here uh, to, to doctrine. Doctrine is teaching, instruction. It's what is taught. Amen. It's what is taught. That's what doctrine is, okay? Uh, then the Revelation 1 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Think about that. Blessed. That word blessed means happy, okay? Happy are those who read. The words in this book. Amen. And I know that was directed primarily to the book of Revelation, but I think it's meant for the whole word of God. It's a blessing to be able to read God's word. Do you know there was times in history where people could not read at all? There was times in history where the church at that time locked the word of God up and only certain people could read it. We live in a time and age today where I mean, on our phones alone, I think on my phone I have like, I don't know, 50, 60 different translations of the Bible, okay? And some of them are in Greek and Hebrew, and I can't read that, so, so but I'm talking about English translations, okay? And, and uh, right at my fingertips, I'm carrying it around with me all the time, every day, you know? Uh, as they say, it's attached to my hip, okay? <laughs> but blessed is he who reads, and those who hear the words of this prophecy. Amen? We are blessed, man. We are blessed to be able to have God's word available to us right now at our fingertips. Right now at our fingertips. Okay. Now, the study is to educate, to train, to analyze, to research, examine, investigate, scrutinize, and probe. Okay? So it's a little bit different than reading, isn't it? Reading is just opening up the book and reading. You know, just going verse by verse in that. But study is not only opening up the book and reading, but you, now you're going to take the time to, like sometimes you've got to take it word by word as you study word studies and that, okay? I, I made a list of different uh, tools that one would need, and I'm going to get to that eventually, one would need if they're really going to do a study of God's word. And a lot of people say, well, that's the pastor's responsibility. Or that's the elder's responsibility. Or that's the one that, no, the Bible doesn't say that. It doesn't, it, that's our responsibility. We need to have a hunger in our hearts for God's word that I'm going to research and study the word of God so that I know it for myself. Amen. 
Okay? So that I'm not re relying on some man or some person to tell me what it's saying and what it means, that I am seeking God through the study, through the research of, of looking into the meaning of words, looking into whether it's the Greek uh, lexicons or whether it's the uh, Hebrew Aramaic lexicons or whatever, whatever it might be, the concordances, uh, there's dictionaries, all kinds of Greek dictionaries that are available. I mean, it, we have so much available to us today to help us to study God's word so that, you know what, none of us should be able to say, well, I, I don't know what that means. Then you know what, you need to take time to study it out. And if you study it out for yourself, it becomes yours, man. It becomes a part of you, and nobody can take that from you. Amen? And I see this, this again, is all part of the process of renewing the mind. Because guess what? We were, from, uh, from knee high to a grasshopper, if you will, we were all of our lives trained by this world system, a system that promotes laziness, that promotes a, a, a sense of eh, school. Oh, man, what a bummer. I got to go to school. Not realizing how vitally important, how blessed we are to be able to go to school. You know what I mean? I know when I was a kid, I didn't realize it, how, how blessed I was to be able to go to school. But as an adult now, I realize how important it is to have the tools necessary to be able to study God's Word. And see, God's Word tells us to do this. Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.15, be diligent. Be diligent. Now, the word diligent... I, got it, I believe I got it here somewhere. Well, the word diligent means to, you know what, to pursue after no matter what, okay? The idea is that I'm going to hunt this down. I'm going to dig for this. I'm going to look for this until I find the answer. I'm going to do it diligently. I'm going to do it without wasting time. I'm going to focus on this. This is going to be a primary concern of my life. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God. No, no, no. Approve to the pastor, right? Uh, approve to the elder, right? Uh, uh, approve to my buddy, uh, you know, or, or my husband or my wife. No, 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 no. It's to be approved to God. In, in fact, here, diligent, hardworking, industrious, meticulous, thorough, attentive, persistent. That's the idea. That's, that needs to be the attitude of our hearts when we're getting into God's Word, when we're going to study God's Word. And a lot of people say, well, that's too much. I, I need to do this. I need to do that. Well, you need to, then, from my perspective, you need to prioritize what's important to you in your life. Amen? Is, is a, a TV program more important than the Word of God? Uh, is, is uh, some kind of uh, sports event or whatever it might be. It could be any number of things. And nowadays, especially when you can record whatever you want to watch anyway, okay, on a DVR, and watch it anytime you want at, at your leisure. Okay, but the Word of God is so important, man, for us as Christians to, 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 so that we're not ensnared, so that we're not caught up into all kinds of weird cultic belief systems and that, you know, that will twist us into a pretzel. I'm telling you, uh, I, I'm telling you, I know from firsthand, okay? But he said, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed. And it, guess what? If you're not going to take the time to just not just read God's word, but study God's word, you've got people out here, like I, I've often heard before, you know what? Most people, if a Jehovah's Witness knocks on the door, uh, the best thing to do is leave the door closed if you don't know how to answer them according to the word of God, okay? Because they will make a pretzel out of you. They will, I mean, they're so indoctrinated into their belief system, you will actually think that hey, maybe, they're, maybe what they're saying is right. When you know in your heart of hearts it's not right, that there's something off about it, there's something wrong about it, okay? But see, if you're studying God's word and really digging into God's word, you'll be able to pick up right away uh, Whatever they say. Well, Jesus was not, really. He was created. He was a created being. He wasn't really God the Son, eternal, from, all, from eternity past into eternity future, and always will be the second person of the Trinity, because there's no such thing as a Trinity, according to them, okay? Uh, and and uh, the teaching that we, they called, uh, 
that history has called this and theologians, uh, when they say Jesus is not God, he was created. It's Arianism, okay? Now, if you don't know this ahead of time, you might walk away scratching your head and say, wow, I never heard it quite put that way. Never heard it quite put that way. And, I mean, there's a slim possibility that you might get sucked into that. Okay, and next thing you know, you find yourself hanging out with them and uh, going to their studies. And, and next thing you know, you find yourself, I mean, really ensnared in that teaching. But if you know the truth, if you're diligent in your study of God's word, right away you're going to be able to say, no, nah, that's not right. The Bible tells me, the Bible tells me that Jesus is the Son of God. Amen. That, you know what, that he was born of the Virgin Mary, okay, that he rose from the dead bodily, that he wasn't just his spirit just rose out of the grave. No, he rose from the grave bodily. And here's some proof in Scripture. Thomas put his fingers in the side of Jesus and put it in his nail prints in his hands, and he fell on his face and he says, My Lord and my God to Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, uh, what, what do you do with that? What do you do with that, you know? And that will shut them up, I'm going to tell you. Especially if they're a new Jehovah's Witness, they will, they will be scratching their head saying, wow, you know, what's going on here, you know? Maybe I need to take time and study this more. 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17 says this, but you must continue in the things which you have learned. Now, that's important to understand it. We must continue in the things we have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom we have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. I always put it this way. From the moment I became a Christian, okay, because guess what? We're all born into Christ as babes in Christ. We're just babies in Christ when we get saved, initially get saved. None of us come uh, saved and knowing all of the theology. and every, No, we need to learn. We need to grow. We need to mature. So we're all born as babes in Christ. And then we're getting into the Word of God. And, and, and along with studying and reading the Word of God and studying the Word of God, we're being taught the Word of God uh, rightly, correctly handled, you know, properly interpreted. Okay? And... This is all a part of the growing process. And Paul is telling Timothy, look, ever since you were a child, you were taught the scriptures. And these scriptures are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And I love this next section. All scripture is given by ins inspiration of God. Uh, the, the, the ins word for inspiration in the Greek is God breathed. It was breathed out by God. It wasn't something man made up. It was something that God breathed out so that what whoever was it, a prophet, whether it was an apostle, whether it was a pastor, whether it was an elder, or whoever it was, guess what? It's God breathing the truth to them. Amen? And it says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man... And I always like to say the man or woman of God, okay, because the idea here is, is the, the Christian, the child of God, okay, that the child of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. God doesn't want us going out in the world to minister the gospel not equipped. God has given us everything we need to be thoroughly equipped completely equipped to minister accurately, to minister uh, in, in a, such a way as to where the individual you're ministering to, they know that what you're talking about, you know what you're talking about. You know you're talking about the Word of God, and you know the Word of God intimately, because why? You have consumed it. It's a part of your life. You've, you've devoted time to study in this Word. Amen? You've, you've taken time and sacrificed sleep. You've sacrificed food. You've sacrificed fun and games and all this other stuff that this world is throwing at you constantly, constantly, amen? Uh, I mean, this world is, Satan is using everything in the book, throwing it our way to distract us from taking the time out to study God's word. And we need to realize this. This is the real thing, man. This is where we're at. We're in a battle here, in a spiritual battle, amen? 1 Peter 3.15 3, says this, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. That word sanctify means to set apart. Amen? 
it, 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 to sanctify the Lord God in your heart, to set apart, apart God in your heart. Amen? To, to, in other words, make God central in your life. Make him of the utmost importance because guess what? He is. Whether you acknowledge it or not, whether you receive it or not, whether you realize it or not, he is of the utmost importance in our lives as Christians. Amen? We, how can we ever even live the Christian life without having God, our focus on him, our focus on him, amen? But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And always, sometimes, uh, only when I feel like it. Uh, you know, if, if, my, if my game is not on, okay, if my game is not on, no, it's always be ready to give a defense for everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. I love that. Always be ready to give a defense. Defense of what? Defense of the gospel, the truth of God's word, who Jesus Christ is, that his death, burial, and resurrection are the cornerstone of Christianity. Amen? If he did not rise from the dead, our, our, our faith is, is, is void. It has no significance. It has no importance because we're believing in a falsehood. Amen? But we know he did rise from the dead. He did rise. And you know what I always tell people? The Bible tells me that 500 people at the same time saw him in his resurrected body. Now, when you go to, uh, how many here ever watched Law and Order, okay, on TV and that? In every courtroom, all you need is two witnesses that saw you do the crime. And, buddy, you're going away. You're going away. Here you had 500 at one time saw him. Oh, it was a mass hallucination. I'm sorry, the, the buzzer goes off. That's a wrong answer, okay? Because there's no such thing as a mass hallucination where everybody sees the same thing, the identical thing, okay? It just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Take it from somebody that knows. Okay, when I was a teenager, I did a lot of hallucination. <laughs> so, you know, and, and God delivered me from that. Praise God, amen? He delivered me from that. So, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. In Proverbs 15, 28, the heart of the righteous studies how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours forth evil. Now the question is, is this, are we going to fall on the side of the righteous or fall on the side of the evil, lazy servant? Amen. 